My name is uh, R.C. Mishra. I am uh, Additional Secretary in the Ministry of Urban Development, Government of India, New Delhi. I have been working in the sector for a little more than a year. Urbanization I, is such a complex issue that more you try to grapple with it, more and more complex issues come up. And when you are called upon to find a solution to a very complex issue, you sometimes wonder and wish that you had a clean slate to write on it. And uh, developing new cities is something very close to writing on a clean city. It gives you a full freedom and challenge to test your planning and execution abilities. We would hear on this from our first speaker, Mr. Ajit Gulabchand, who is the Chairman and Managing Director of Hindustan Construction Company in India. He would share with us his first knowledge and experience about planning and execution and administration of a new city, Lavasa. Welcome to Mr. Gulabchand. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. <clears throat> Well, cities and new cities is, is been now being the talk at almost every major conference that has been held in this last few years. And everybody except the government seems to have woken up to the fact that we need cities. What we are going to see in the next 40 years is a migration of about 400 million people, 40 crore people will migrate from rural areas to urban areas. This estimate can vary slightly from 350 to 450 million, but it's still a huge number. A migration that took almost a thousand years to happen in Europe is going to happen in India in the next 40 years. We've also reached that stage of this major shift of population where it's going to happen exponentially. There is also another interesting demographic that is important to understand this. More than 55% of the country is below the age of 25. Almost 42% of the 21-year-old population of the world will reside in India. So we are looking at a much younger population and the quality of this migration is going to be such that it is not like a certain wave of a few people from Karnataka will come to the city, then some people from the other parts will come and it will go on adding to the city. No, they will come from all over India and all over the world. So India needs to expand its cities, it needs to build new neighborhoods to its cities and towns and also build new cities. Professor Prahlad of the Chicago University has said, even laid down the figure approximately, we will need 500 new cities. And this is a big challenge, particularly when we haven't even recognized the fact that human beings live cities to live in. After all, we forget that the world's civilizations have been built around cities. The word civilization comes from the word civic, which has everything to do with the city. When we talk of civil society, civil liberties, we are discussing a city. So everything centers around the city when it comes to civilization. Whether you see Rome, you see, you see <coughs> Athens, you see Babylon, or whether you see Ayodhya, you see Hastinapur, these are all centered around cities. So it's first thing to important to understand is civilizations are spawned around cities. And we, for some reason, have felt that, that and romanticized our villages. The footpaths, the sidewalks of cities like Bombay were a better proposition than the villages of India. That's why the migration took place. So this romanticizing the villages set, given a setback <clears throat> and made us assume that cities are a necessary evil. But they take care of themselves. They do not. And it is extremely important that we pay attention to this. Not only does this, is not there, the constitution has been, was amended 
And the 73rd and 74th Amendment of the Constitution gave us that these third tier of government, which is the city governments or town governments, will be created. Unfortunately, the amendments do not lay down any timetable. And as a result, the states have been very tardy in trying to implement this. We are also a union of states like the United States of America. But the United States of America derived, formed the union. The union was formed by the states. So the states decided what the federal setup should be. The states also decided how the towns and the counties in their own state would be managed. However, in India, the power seems to have devolved at the country level, and then we created the states, and the states were to then create cities and towns which would then get their own independence to manage under the umbrella of the state. We still haven't got down to doing that. <clears throat> and as a result, we have urban chaos, because there is no accountability to the citizen. And therefore, you find a cry at even a general election of the Parliament of India, everybody asking for roads, everybody asking for water, everybody asking for schools, which are purely local city functions. The reason is we haven't allowed the city entity to develop, and it's extremely important, therefore, that we carry out this structuring, carry out the 73rd, 74th Amendment, and create empowered governments of towns and cities. And by this I mean not only cities like Bombay and Delhi and Bombay and Calcutta, but also places like Ratnagiri, Surat, Sagar, any small town that you would like to hear. Because after all that is going to happen. Small villages will become little towns, little towns will become big towns, big towns will become cities. And it's necessary to bring this about so that all the constituents of governing the city or town become accountable to the citizen of that particular city or town. What is extraordinary is that once you start doing that, including the police, take for example Bombay as an example, and you will find that there is nothing accountable to its citizen. There are 11 statutory bodies that look after Bombay's needs, from MARDA, to MMRDA, to Mar Mar uh, Mumbai Transport, to a whole host of them. And not one of them is accountable to the citizen of Bombay. They all report to the state government. The Municipal Corporation of Bombay, which technically is accountable to the citizen, is still based on the old British principle where the Municipal Commissioner is more powerful than the Mayor. And even the Standing Committee of the Corporation has only a certain rights and can only veto the, the, the municipal commissioner twice. So all they do is sit and charge rent for the period they have a certain influence over the city and its decisions. The municipal commissioner on the other hand is the appointee of the state government and then goes on to become somebody else in the state government and thereafter even at the central government, Mr. B.G. Deshmukh is a classic example of the Municipal Commissioner of Bombay, then Chief Secretary of Maharashtra, Cabinet Secretary of India, and he only talked about people getting more freedoms from the government after he retired. So basically we have a situation that there is nobody accountable to the citizen of Bombay. And similarly to Pune or Ratnagiri or Salem or uh, G G Golconda or anybody. So I think it's time for us to understand this is very essential that we create this accountability, bring it closer. Same thing happens with the police commissioner. And therefore you are not able to get the infrastructure of any city right. If the planning is outside the city, if the planning is outside the MMRDA, it reports to the state government. Why? Why can't there be a strong mayor of Bombay in council or whichever way you like and they decide how city of Bombay should be planned, how it should be redesigned and therefore create a serious accountability. It is only when this happens that we will get urban infrastructure going. When you get a chief minister who has to deal with 200 towns of 400, 300 towns and cities in the state 
and one urban development secretary looking after it, and another urban development secretary in Delhi going to give general guidelines on what should happen. How do you expect this to be governed? It is not possible. It's such a huge country of 1.2 billion people and growing. It cannot, unless it is governed locally, unless we find models to do that. This is extremely important to understand. I reiterate this. Even in the context of new cities, this will have to be done. And what is more important now, that with speed with which we will have to create these cities, speed with which we will have to redesign big cities like Bombay and others, speed with which we'll have to create new neighborhoods, it cannot be done without public-private partnership. And I'll give you an example of another public-private partnership and its relevance and therefore why it cannot be done. Take, for example, the National Highway Authority of India. If it were to build the road, National Highway, the Golden Quadrilateral, the East-West Highways, and the North-South Highway system, the old-fashioned way of creating a government department to do that, we would have to create a department as big as the Indian Railways even before we get going. And that is not possible any longer. So they created a small department of about 400 people now, sitting in one building in Delhi. Everything else is a public-private partnership. Not all of public-private partnership means investment by the private sector. It can mean job done by the private sector, outsourced to the private sector. Everything from contract creation to design to feasibility to supervision to actual construction to maintenance, everything is done privately by the NHI. They only own the right of way on behalf of the people of India. It's only such a model that it was possible that when it actually set about going about its program, it took barely two years for them to start moving three years, within three years of their initiation, not formation, initiation, when they were revived and said they will now work, you moved from 11 kilometers a day of road building to 11 kilometers a year of road building to 11 kilometers a day. So public-private partnership works and it works fast and that's the therefore only way forward given the objective that we have to build so much more. And to create a structure of accountability, it is very difficult for a mayor of a city or a small town to turn around and say, to contain. Then all these complaints of citizens, all these demands of citizens are much better met. And this belief that some central planner can does no better than the citizen, I think we must get rid of this idea. I'm not saying that the simple, ordinary citizen cannot plan. I mean, I'm not saying that he can actually plan. But he knows what he wants. He knows the things that he do. He understands the way things flow. And when you put your ears to the ground and listen to him, the planner can actually deliver a better plan. We've got to think of a variety of things. We all worry about congestion. But cities are about congestion. We all must live like this. So there is a density that creates efficiency of infrastructure. If you are too sparse, simple movement from one place to another is a huge task and extremely expensive. Second is to create a simple bus system, a train system, as you can see in Delhi, is a nightmare. Whereas in a very dense population, you create substantially a walking city. The infrastructure efficiency is extremely high. The second is the security. There are eyes on the street. Security is not some policeman standing around. I mean, when you see a, 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 a tank, a military tank standing around, all kinds of heavily guarded policemen with huge machine guns standing around, I mean, think about it. You as a Bombay citizen, after what happened to us, might feel a bit safe. But look at a visitor. He said, this place needs all this to protect itself. This is not a secure place. It's best not to be here. So it's very important for us to realize that security, a good part of it is, is eyes on the street. And that's one of the reasons the slums, which are very dense uh, uh, habitats, 
you will find that the crime rate in the slums is the lowest. The reason for that is, how much crime can you commit under the gaze of so many people all the time? So we have to keep the density of a city with its understanding in mind. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have efficient infrastructure. That doesn't mean we must have efficient governing. There's a whole host of things we need to do. We removed the hawkers from Marine Drive because this was a demand of some 25 years ago. But hawkers are eyes on the street. Often you ask the policeman, you will find that the hawkers have given clues to where a thing has been stolen. It is these people on the street that helped Police Commissioner, I, IG, Director General Gill to bring about a lot of information on terrorist movement in Punjab. So we must understand that the complexity of a city must take into consideration all this. And another interesting thing about a city is that it's a very viable unit. If it is growing and if it's vibrant, it's a money-making unit. And you will be surprised that Instead of shunning migration, as we sometimes now see, you will find that if you allow cities to govern themselves, towns, they will be wondering, we need to grow, we need to bring in, attract people to come to this city, both as visitors, as permanent residents who, are, who, who create GDP for the city. All this idea of keep out the, keep out the people who are, don't belong to the city will just vanish, because the city won't survive without that. All those people who live in the Jugis of Bombay or any other place, or those who come from elsewhere, they are citizens who contribute to the GDP of Bombay. Gee, Bombay won't be so rich, its municipal corporation won't be able to have a 21,000 crore budget without all these people's hard work. So the cities will start wanting to people to migrate to it so that it can continue to be vibrant and go on increasing its revenue and add to it. So people will huddle around and start seeing I don't know how many of you saw the movie Jaws, which is about a shark being in the waters of a seaside town which is dependent on tourism during summer. And they all try to hide that shark, that shark menace, say it doesn't exist because they're worried that if we said that, then the people, tourists won't come and the city would die. So it's extremely important that cities govern themselves. I see this in this backdrop. Because one is attempting here, when the Maharashtra government wanted Hill Station built, we hadn't built one since the British left. We came forth and said we will do that. An area was demarcated around the beautiful Varas Gaurek, created for irrigation. And we began the concept of building a new city. Now this city is built on the principles of new urbanism, which is really not needed in India, where we do have dense cities anyways. But the idea is that 80% of the people will live in 20% of the livable area. So you create a walking city, a safe city. And so you don't have excessive commute from outside into the place. Second is that it is based also on the principle of a transact model, where it's dense in the middle and it becomes sparse as you go out, rather than having suburbs where the middle classes live and, and the city where the rich lives. So that they are constantly a huge mass of people have to migrate in and out. Second is, the next important thing about a big city is not, it, it must be across socio-economic spectrum. Including people that will come and have rental homes. If you recall Bombay, a good part of Bombay was rental homes whether it was the Bombay Chawls or whether it was the Bombay uh, middle classes, very few rich had bungalows in Bombay. The rest were all living in by and large rental accommodation. And there's no such thing as a cheap, affordable housing. I've read ads of some affordable housing. There are about three hours outside Bombay somewhere in the jungle at the cost of a concrete construction. Is that affordable? Can somebody give me a, a 150 square foot lovely humble apartment, a small little room to live in, in Nariman Point at affordable prices? You know, and the word affordable is very, very, very dicey. You can have an affordable Rolls Royce also. They have created one. They found the Rolls Royce was too expensive. Nobody was buying, so they created a slightly cheaper version, made it, somebody called it affordable. 
What we want, there is no such thing as really low cost housing. That low cost housing is rental housing. And it must be available. And it's an extraordinary model that rental housing, which goes by way of workforce housing for some people, it goes by way of uh, uh, social housing most of the time, is actually a revenue earning model. When club together and you create social housing, which is given out on rent, you create a population in the city. And though all the money may not come by way of rent, it does come by way of the food these people eat, of the shops it sp allows it to spawn, of the whole activity of transportation that it feeds. So overall, a social housing actually creates. And when we talk of juggies being uh, uh, occupied by people coming from the outside, you know, somebody who is coming from a village looking to Bombay or Pune or any such place for work, it's the first thing he, he's on his mind is not to grab some land and build himself a house. He takes it on rental. That's the only way he can live here. And if he can't afford that, he sleeps on the street. It's the responsibility of government to provide that. And it is not possible for a state government to provide this across all the towns in the state. It has to be the responsibility of the local self-government. And must welcome this new guy because he's going to come and add to the GDP of his city and make it grow and make it more vibrant, make it economically more prosperous. Allowing, therefore, and city is also about a lot of cultural themes. There must be drama, there must be uh, colleges, there must be discussions, there must be... Uh, there, there's a whole host of cultural activity that is the heart of the city. Bombay was once upon a time like that. There's not that much cultural activity now. In the evening, not enough not enough theatres, only cinemas, only, only cinemas. Other than that, very little other cultural life has remained in the city and is essential for the city to be vibrant and growing. And it is this constitutes the new way of doing things. And so in this new place, we took on this challenge of building Lavasa. We have based it on the Transact model, on the principles of new urbanism. And the second most important thing now is that it has to be green. And what does green mean? Green means that it has to be sustainable. And for it to be sustainable, it must preserve, restore, and enhance the ecology of the place in which it is set. And this is what we have planned. What we inherited there was a land, denuded land. Most of the forests there were cut down for providing wood coal to Pune city the pictures of barren land around there. We have to plant three million trees and hydro seed every slope in that seven hills so that it will stop the soil erosion that takes place today. It is one of the highest rainfalls after Chirapunji in the country is in that area. And that denudes the land because it's bare now and 60% of that water runs off along with the topsoil, further making the land barren. So we have to create that soil conserving um, plantation of hydro seeding the slopes, and creating contour trenches so that the topsoil doesn't burn off and the trees take root and you will get therefore reduce the runoff to just 20% which is what everywhere it should be. And thereby greening the entire place and therefore its water requirement comes down and even in the month of May where this has been done in Lavasa, you will find complete green trees. Then after they take root, they don't need water. The three months in the year is important because that's how those trees are. In India, you get, you get water only three months in a year. Therefore, we are also engaged biomimicry, the new science of adapting to nature, created by Janine Benius, the third recipient after Al Gore and Gorbachev of the Friends of the Planet Award by the United Nations. The idea is to adapt to nature. And that is the moist deciduous forest in the Sayadri. And this is the kind of trees, once they take root, they need water only for that period and then they get through and then they survive throughout the year. And they keep the groundwater levels up, therefore it continues to exist. And these are the principles that we are following. Because the tree in London is also green, but it gets rain throughout the year. 
So it has a very different way of adapting. Each place has a genius of its own and you have to adapt to that. Ant hills around the world are the same where the ants live at the same temperature. But when you see the ant hill and its gradients and its thickness and the, and the, and the, 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 the surface of the walls of that, you'll find they're completely different. The ants have been able to figure out how to live. And so if we can mimic that, even in the architecture of the city, for example, in trees, you need, for a heavy downpour like this, you need a three-tire canopy of trees, the tall, the medium, and the, all clustered together so that the water doesn't hit the ground hard. Can we mimic architecture so there are three levels of roofs so that the same thing happens? So there are a variety of ways we can do this. Now when you come to Bombay, it'll have to be completely different. It's got to be high-rise. To create low-cost housing, there's got to be high-rise because there's no way the cost of land is so expensive unless you create at least even 10 or 15 or 50 FSI, you will not be able to get rental housing that's cheap enough. And it again has to be redone in clusters, like neighborhoods are, like new cities are. So these are some of the features that Let Lavasa is going to follow. Then it comes to the question also of, of governance. When it comes to governance, how are we going to deal with it? We already have been appointed as a special planning authority, the first private sector company to get that status. Why? If we had gone by the method today prescribed to take the collector's permission for every building, it would have taken us 10,000 years to just get the permissions. There's no way it can be done unless the authority is decentralized. And if we could break three fundamental laws that we could bring this figure of 10,000 down to 200 years. But if you have to preserve the laws and do it, this will have to be delegated to a local authority, which was God created. We are now discussing a public-private partnership with the police, because there are some sovereign things only the police should do, but the rest can be outsourced, can be done. Parking, supervision, traffic management, the hardware for the police that is required. There's a whole host of things. This is under discussion. And we are looking at how do we now create a public-private partnership in the municipal governance where the citizens that live in Lavasa have a right to decide what they want and how much of it should be privatized so that the services continue to be, to be good in the city. This is something that will have to be evolved. And the organizers of this conference and the several experts that will speak here will help us develop that. So the idea is that if you have to create new cities and create them that fast, if you have to create new neighborhoods and create them that fast, improve the existing city from clusters and do that fast, we'll have to enter into public-private partnerships so that it can happen faster and delivery will come. I'll give you another example of how public-private partnership actually works. Delhi used to be provided electricity by the Delhi Electricity Undertaking, so Electric Supply Undertaking. Terrible government organization. You never got enough, sorry, you never got enough uh, uh, electricity. And suddenly they privatized. People complained, but just complained. Suddenly they privatized it. And when they privatized it, People came out in the street, what, if, what is Ratan Tata doing? What is Anil Ambani doing? Why isn't he providing electricity? And the funny part is the same bureaucrat and the politician who was running it before came out and said, yes, Ratan Tata, why aren't you providing it? Now one way of looking at it is look at how terrible these people are. They were themselves not doing it. Somebody else is now trying and they're getting it. But that's how it works. Look at it another way. The government was doing what government should be doing demanding performance of the private sector, entrusted with the task of providing electricity on behalf of its people. And that's how you get a public-private partnership going to produce good for society. And that's how we want to use it to produce Lavasa. Here are some quick pictures of the Lavasa that you want to see. This is the current status. So to just give you a quick idea of this place. This is the first town that will be ready by the end of this year. This is at the same town at night. It's India's, one of India's largest construction sites with 20,000 workers getting ready to deliver the first town by the end of this year. 
and all construction you see is sold. Well, that is it about the concept of cities, concept of new cities, and the public-private partnerships role in creating one. Thank you very much.